Hello friends. Now today we are going to see gear trends and its application. So gear trends is nothing but it is the combination of gears which are mounted on the shaft so as to transmit the power from one shaft to another. And it is uh, also called as the train of the tooth wheels. So there are different types of gear train such as simple gear train, compound gear train, reverted gear train, and epicyclic gear train. So first of all we will see simple gear train. So as in the diagram if you are seeing, so one is the driver with, in which this input is given to this driver wheel and this is the follower which means, which means what it is the driven part. So here uh, one gear is mounted on each of the shaft so that power will be transmitted from input to output means the one gear is mounted respectively on each individual shaft. And so the, in this way, we can calculate the speed ratio for the simple gear train. So these are the formulas so as to find the gear ratio for the simple gear train. So what is the role of this intermediate gears? So sometimes the distance between the two gears is large. So in this case, uh, we can provide the large size gear or we can just provide one or more intermediate gears. So this intermediate gears, they are called as the idler gears. So uh, particularly when uh, odd number of uh, idler gears or intermediate gears are provided, then motion of both the gears means the sense of rotation of both the gears is same. And if you provide even number of idler gears or intermediate gears within a gear pair, the motion of the gears means sense of rotation will be different. So what uh, particularly what is the effect means for what purpose we are using this idler gears here if you see to connect the gears where a large distance is required and so as to obtain the motion of the driven and driver gear in respect to uh, sense such as clockwise or anti-clockwise. So for this purpose we are using this intermediate gears which are also called as the idler gears or idle gears. So next gear train is the compound gear train. So here the basic difference between simple and compound if you see here so suppose now gear 1 which is mounted on shaft A and here on shaft B two gears are mounted gear 2 and gear 3 and gear 4 is mounted on the third shaft that is shaft C. So input is given to the shaft A and output is taken from the shaft C. So here on the shaft B both gear 2 and gear 3 they are mounted on the same shaft so the speed of both the gears will be same. So such type of configuration of gear 3 is called as compound gear train. And here in this compound, compound gear train, we are obtaining a various or variation in the speed ratio. So here, particularly there will be no any need of providing idler gears and uh, whatever the speed ratio we require as per the application we can obtain. So these are, these are the formulas in which we can obtain the speed ratio. And the advantage point of this compound gear train over the simple is that much longer speed reduction. As I have already told that we are getting a speed variation as maximum speed variation as compared to simple gear train. So now we will see the animation. In this video, we will start taking a look at gear trains. Primarily, we'll be looking at three types, simple gear trains, compound gear trains, and epicyclic gear trains. Simple gear trains consist of single individually mounted gears whose axis of rotation are fixed in space. Here is an example of a simple gear train. As the name suggests, gear train consists of a series of gears connected to each other, forming a chain-like structure. Uh, in simple gear trains, only the first and the last gear in the train decide the velocity ratio. All the intermediate gears are not contributing to velocity ratio. At the most, they will be affecting the direction in which the last gear rotates. Adding a gear or removing a single gear would reverse that direction. Uh, their role would be more towards providing a conduit for power. So they just take power from one gear and pass it on to the next one. And uh, this is how it moves. Let us see it in motion. So you can see at every uh, engagement, so at every pair, uh, the direction gets reversed. So the red gear moves in anti-clockwise direction, clockwise, anti-clockwise, and clockwise again. 
And the velocity ratio is just the function of the number of teeth on the first gear, Z1, and number of teeth on the last gear, Z4 here, and that is going to give us a velocity ratio. Now, since all these gears are connected to each other, engaging with each other, forming a chain, all of them must have the same module or the same pitch. And therefore, their sizes will be linearly, directly proportional to the number of teeth that they have. Now, suppose you want to get a very large velocity ratio. What would it mean? That would mean the ratio Z4 upon Z1 is very large. And therefore, the size of your first or the last gear will be uh, much larger than uh, the other one. And this may not be very convenient from space point of view. So for getting a large velocity ratio, simple gear train is not a practical solution. For that, we use compound gear trains. Compound gear trains are made up of compound gears. Compound gears are uh, like pairs of gears coupled to the same shaft. So when they rotate, they will be rotating together at the same uh, speed, or same RPM. And this kind of compound gears can be connected to each other to form what is called as a compound gear train. So here is one. So we start with a simple gear with number of teeth Z1. It is engaging with this green compound gear or the larger member of that compound gear. So the speed will reduce from the red to this green speed will reduce. But at the same speed, the smaller part of it will also start rotating, which engages with the larger part of uh, this blue gear. That lower speed is given to this smaller part. And then it engages with this purple gear, which rotates even slower. So this way we are getting reduction in speed at every engagement from this red to green, from this green to blue and from blue to purple. So in stages, we can achieve the reduction in speed or increase in speed if you are moving in the other direction. And uh, we can achieve a very large velocity ratio. So here you can see the velocity ratio is not just decided by the first and the last gear, but all the intermediate gears contribute to it. And therefore you are seeing all these terms, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5, the number of teeth on the intermediate gears. This is how it rotates. So you can see uh, our first gear here is rotating uh, much faster as compared to this one. And you can see successively the speed is reducing. The green one is rotating a little slower, blue even slower, and the purple one is the slowest. So next gear train is the rebuttal gear train. So now in this rebuttal gear train, if you see, so now these are the two shafts. One is the input shaft and the other one is the output shaft. So both of the shaft they are coaxial, means they are inline. But here the gear one and gear two, they are forms a simple gear pair, and gear two and gear three they forms a compound gear. So here input is given to one and output is taken from the four. So this is the basic difference between compound gear train and the rivetry gear train. So in which the both input and output shaft they are inline, means they are coaxial with respect to each other. So particularly this is the as we see in the previous slide that your PCD, the pitch circle diameter module, they are same for the gear pair. So on that basis, this is the relation. So pitch circle radius of first and second addition is equal to it will be pitch circle radius summation of third and fourth. And this similarly to the number of teeth on that respective gear pair. So we see the animations of your gear pair. Here we are going to look at a commonly used type of gear train called as the reverted gear train where the input and output shafts are collinear or even coincident. And the power is transmitted from input to output via a third shaft, which is parallel to them both. Here is an example of a reverted gear train used in automobiles, where the input shaft shown in red here and the output shaft shown in gray are collinear. The power flows from the engine to the input shaft, and then it takes a detour via this gear pair. So it flows to the lay shaft and through the lay shaft and this gear engagement, it again comes back to the output shaft. Let us now see some broad steps in the design of such a gearbox. 
you start by taking the range of gear ratios that we want to achieve, say from one to four, and we are going to divide that into parts. These parts are not arranged in an arithmetic progression, so they are not like one, two, three, and four, but they are rather arranged in a geometric progression. So each gear ratio is going to be a constant multiple of the previous one. And to find those multiples, I'm going to express this one and four, the two extremes, as the powers of the maximum gear ratio, four. So one will be expressed as four raised to zero, and four will be expressed, of course, as four raised to one. Then I'm going to take this maximum power that we want to achieve and divide it into three equal parts because we are going to reach from one to four in three jumps or three steps. So this zero will become zero upon three. This one will become three upon three. And that will give us the intermediate powers like one upon three and two upon three. And finally, we'll get the gear ratios required. So four raised to one upon three is 1.59 and four raised to two upon three is 2.52. So we have our geometric progression now. Let us see how to incorporate the geometric progression into a gearbox. To understand the idea behind this design, imagine a step pulley over here with four steps, say 50, 20, 25, and 30. And another step pulley with now decreasing steps, say 30, 25, 20, and 50. And then if we have a belt between them that can be shifted, then we will get various speed ratios. Of course, here we are using gears, so there is no belt to be shifted because gears engage directly. So instead of the belt, we will shift the gears. And to allow them to uh, be shifted, we are going to provide our shaft with some splines. I've shown them in green. So on these splines, I will be able to slide this gear, compound gear EG, to the right or left. Similarly, I'll be able to slide this green gear here to the right or left. Moreover, we have provided some teeth on the surface, on the face of this green gear here, so that it can directly engage with the red gear on the other side. This type of engagement is called as a dog clutch. So now we are going to slide these gears and achieve various ratios. As far as the blue gears are concerned, they are rigidly coupled to the lay shaft. So all of them are rotating at the same speed all the time. So here is our gearbox in neutral, where the power is flowing from the engine to the input shaft and via this engagement to the lay shaft. But none of the gears on the lay shaft is engaging with any gears on the output shaft and therefore it is not flowing any further or to the wheels. So the engine and wheels are cut off from each other. Then we are going to engage our first gear by sliding this yellow gear to the right. So now the power starts flowing to the output shaft and you can see there is a reduction here and there is another reduction here. So we get a very high gear ratio. It can be calculated using the number of feet as shown. Then we are going to engage the second gear. In second gear, we slide this yellow uh, gear to the left so power starts flowing like this. You can see there is a reduction, but not as much as in the first gear. The gear ratio has this reduced to two. In the third gear, we are going to engage these two gear, uh, gears. So now the reduction is even smaller, say 1.6. And finally, we are going to go to the top gear. To get the top gear or the fourth gear, we are going to slide this green gear to the left. So using these teeth, the top clutch, the green and the red gear will directly engage with each other. And in that case, the power is going to flow directly from the input to the output shaft. Of course, in this case, the lay shaft will continue to rotate because this engagement is there for the time. Okay, so this was regarding the beginning gear chain. Now next gear chain is the epicycle gear chain. Now here, if you see, so there is basic difference between the first three gear train and this gear train that here, this gear one and gear two is now connected with this link. And in this, if this link is fixed, then this two gear pair forms a simple gear pair. But if this link is having relative motion, then either of the gear, they will be having relative motion with respect to this gear first. 
So this is the basic difference between above three kilograms and the epicyclic kilograms. You will see here in the animation. So far, we have seen simple and compound gear trains where the axis of all the gears were fixed. Now we are going to look at gear trains where the axis will be moving or orbiting in space around other gears. And just to show you how dramatically different the results are going to be, here is a simple coin trick. So here we have two identical coins and we are going to treat them like two meshing gears. And suppose I rotate this coin through some angle then this will rotate through the same angle, but in the opposite direction. Nothing unexpected. This is like a simple gear train. Now imagine this coin is fixed and this one is made to roll on it without slip. So it is going to kind of walk over the other coin. In that case, what do you expect? When this completes one orbit, how many rotations it would complete? Uh, top of the head reaction is, well, if they are of the same size, one orbit, one round trip should cause one rotation. But let us check that. So we will start rolling the coin. And now it has completed quarter of a revolution. So this was our initial position. And you can see the coin has become upside down. So it has undergone half the rotation in quarter of an orbit. And the trend we can check further. Now we have completed one rotation because the coin is upright again, but it has completed only half the orbit. So the number of rotation and number of orbits are not equal. Say one complete orbit and we, are, we have completed two revolutions, two rotations. So this is what happens when one gear starts orbiting the other in engagement. Let us now replace those two coins with gears. So this gear has replaced our fixed coin. This has replaced our orbiting coin. Uh, this orbiting gear will be called as the planet. And you might have guessed this is called as the sun. Uh, we are going to do two generalizations. Number one, the sun and the planet could be of different size. And number two, though the axis of the sun is fixed, it is free to rotate about that axis. In physical arrangements, the sun and the planet are connected by a link like this, which supports the planet. This is called as the arm. And additionally, we may have an uh, internal gear going around this whole arrangement and engaging with this planet. It is called as the annulus or the ring gear. This sort of gear trains are called as epicyclic gear trains, where one or more gears will have their axis orbiting in space. Epicyclic gear trains have more than one degree of freedom. That means we'll be able to choose more than one input independently. Let me show you how. So we are going to set this sun in motion, but we have kept the arm fixed. So this is like a simple gear train. And uh, now on top of this, if we give this arm some motion, then it will become a epicyclic gear train. So we are choosing the motion of the sun and the arm independently. So let me give this arm some moment. Again. Now the sun, the arm, and everything else is moving. And we chose the motion of the sun and arm independently. So this has got two degrees of freedom. Now you might think, uh, what's a big deal about having more degrees of freedom? Well, if you put many of these together into a gearbox, you will realize the benefit. Because such a gearbox will not need any engaging and disengaging of gears. You can keep all of them in engagement all the time. To change the velocity ratio, all you need to do is grab one gear and fix it and release another one. That combination will give you a velocity ratio. To change it, you just release the gear that you had grabbed now and you fixed some other one and it changes. So all you need is some kind of braking arrangement thereby you can stop any gear at will. Of course, it quickly becomes complicated and therefore we'll not be able to draw these sort of diagrams or make much sense of it. So we'll look at the schematic representation often used. So here we have, instead of a front view, a schematic cross-sectional side view. So this is our sun. It is engaging with a compound planet mounted on this arm. 
on the other side the planet is engaging with this ring gear this sort of diagram also helps you calculate the number of teeth the sun here has 40 teeth so we go up to here then we add the 16 of the planet so we have come up to this level and then 32 more for the other side of the planet that makes 88 teeth on the ring gear thank you